I'm starting to speak up. Welcome, everyone. It's my very special pleasure uh, to welcome Angela Nieto, our speaker today first, and welcome all of you. And it's, it's just fantastic. Look around. We didn't have that for years, and now we're back, and we're back even better and stronger. That's how we are. This is really cool. Thanks for coming, and I promise it's, it's going to be an exciting afternoon. And you see that there, there's slug vacation disasters. That's half a joke for Angela, half for you, because you may have done the experiment, right? Take a slug, Nacktschnecke, put it into salt water. If that's a crazy experiment, don't do it yourself. Rather come to us for the summer course. Unfortunately, too late for 2023. There are some, lucky you, you're accepted, you're in. But if you want to do a really cool, crazy experiment, come next year, apply. The ads are going to be out and you just have to apply. There's another thing that you may not want to miss. Maybe you want to point to your parents. I will have the rector of Heidelberg University in front of me and I'll extract information that he otherwise probably doesn't easily give away. And that I think will be a very interesting early afternoon. And I heard the dodo is going to be around. So if you never saw the dodo, in our exhibition there, we're going to put it, we're going to bring it, and the rector will see it. There is another thing coming up at the very end of the circle, and that is a QR code and the login for the internet here. Why is that important? It is important because you can give your feedback to NAVIG, the Nationale Institut für Wissenschaftskommunikation in uh, Karlsruhe, and they want to get your response to what we're doing here. And it would be extremely helpful if you were to open the web page and give your frank feedback. It's not only here, it will also be, the QR code will also be outside, but what you should look up for is the password, which is easy, cost one, two, three, four, museum, exclamation mark. So that is something to remember. Good, this was the technical announcements. The first thing I should do besides saying hello to all of you, is to thank people who made that whole thing possible here. Frederike Seibold, there she is. Uh, you know her, she's the, the mother of the program, been there from the very beginning. These days, supported by Michael Stitz over there. And we have technical support here from Jonathan Schmidt and Alina. Alisa, I always mix it. Alisa, not Alicia, Alisa. Um, and they will make sure that everything works. And in the back we have Gero, and somewhere there should also be Niklas. He will be, I heard, physically around. And I guess his physical presence uh, will make sure that nothing bad happens with electricity. So what are we expecting? We are expecting a presentation. Before that, I will give a brief introduction. After the presentation, around three or so, there is going to be coffee, soft drinks, cookies, donuts, pretzels, things around, also places to gather around. You can discuss, you can talk, you can be excited, you can fill the questionnaire, don't forget that. And then after so 30 minutes or so, I'm going to call you all to gather in individual groups. So we have tutors for you who, of course, can give you any information you would like to know regarding the presentation, but also everything about what it is to be at the university, what it means to be a student, what it means to do to work in science. These might be questions that, that are coming up, and you can just turn to the people, and these are people with these yellow lanyards. And I will just start the whole thing, you know that, I, I heard it's a meme and it may be somewhere in the internet. So I will initiate the whole process like that. And I will do that outside. And you just look around for other people doing that. But instead of blue for size, they rather do it for yellow for Nikon. And there might be a red for Leica around as well. So uh, you can't miss them. And you're gathering in groups. Ideally, you're, you're splitting up if you're coming from one class. And it's not the same coherent group, but rather you're trying to explore the new thing. This will last for 30, 40 minutes, roughly, and Frederike will bring our guest around, and ideally, 
she sees all the groups, but it's unlikely to happen because I know the students, the students are very, very curious and they don't let you easily move on. So this is this, and then we reconvene here and you will have as long as you want to and as long as we can really do it easily uh, to discuss with Angela questions that came up in the discussions that could be related to the topic, but also related to what is it to have a career in science? How does that impact on your life? Well, you're all just having your entire life ahead of you, and you may wonder, hey, any decision I take now is going to change everything. Well, you can ask her and find out how she managed, and maybe that gives you some, some better confidence in the future and, and really trust that it doesn't matter what you do as long as you like what you're doing and it's going to be fine. So that's my take on it, but we'll see. So let me introduce Angela. Angela studied in Spain and we just realized that we overlapped. After her PhD, she went to Munich where I was finishing my PhD and she was just 50 meters away from the lab where I was doing my things. But we didn't know. We didn't know each other. We just met a few years later in, in the meetings and that is one of the really exciting things in science. You meet again and again and again and eventually you know a lot of, about the people and it, it turns into friendship and you can exchange not only science, but many things that have really moved us. And you will see that science is a form of life. <laughs> it's really a, people always say it's music that is a unifying uh, topic, but I would think that science, at least I should say natural sciences, because humanities may be different, but natural sciences, this is what I know. This is a life form that is really very good for, for me for Angela, for other scientists you're meeting here. So after that quick intermezzo in, in, in Munich, she went to London, uh, did a postdoc there. This is where she started working on a gene that to me is deeply imprinted with her and that's luck. That's why the joke had to be there. And she started working on the topic she's still dealing with and this is the transition of cells that are more or less initially static and then start crawling away and move. And I think this transition is the thing you're going to hear about today. And if you're interested and want to know more also about the, the deeper ground, come tomorrow. Some of you can because they finished their high school graduation already. And the same thing with more depth we're going to see tomorrow. And for now, Angela, it's, it's a very great pleasure to have you here and that we eventually make that happen with such an audience. Thank you very much for coming and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for your introduction. Um, um, you know, as, as, as Johan said, uh, you know, uh, we met. We don't know exactly when that happened, but we know that we didn't meet when we should have and could have, which is uh, at, at Munich, at the Max Planck Institute. Uh, but nevertheless, we met uh, soon after, and since then, we, you know, exactly as he said, you know, science allows a long friendship. And, um, and it is so nice to do something for work, which is so, um, you know, exciting, and uh, you can meet so many people like, you know, like him. I wanted to tell you that you are very privileged and fortunate to have this institute here because I can tell you that, you know, science here and the atmosphere in the building is amazing. And uh, I would really recommend to actually attend this summer course that uh, he was discussing about because, you know, it can change your life, actually. <laughs> um, you know, for me, um, it was easy to decide being a scientist because I always, I don't know how, and you know, how come, because in my family, I'm the first and still the only scientist in, you know, my family is quite big, but I am the only scientist. And I don't know why and I don't know how, but since I was very small, I really wanted to be a scientist. So my, my actually, my favorite uh, toy was that. I really asked for this, uh, you know, chemistry box that I suppose that now is completely forbidden because it was a bit dangerous, you know. <laughs> and uh, one of the first things that, that I remember is that I had it when I was nine or something like that. And, you know, my dream was to mix things up. 
And of course, I wanted to also mix things up out of the box, and I did, and the thing exploded. And um, that wasn't very nice. And uh, of course, the box disappeared for good. I didn't see it anymore until very recently, actually a few years ago, on top of my, my mom's uh, you know, wardrobe in, in, in her bedroom. So, um, you know, but that, uh, I, as I said, I don't know why or how, but I always wanted uh, to be a scientist. And um, as Johan mentioned, I, I was, um, you know, I was in Madrid, I, I was born in Madrid, and I did my uh, graduate, graduate studies in, in, um, in biology and uh, biochemistry, actually, in Madrid as well. And this is a picture of me. Um, in, I don't know, 81, 81 with my friends at the university. And you'll see why I'm showing you this picture, because you will see another one at the end of my talk. Um, it was really nice. Uh, it was a very sort of new and modern university in, in Madrid, and it was a very exciting time in Spain as well. So we enjoyed really very much there. So I hope that you take advantage. I understand that you will be sooner than later going to you know, the university, many of you, and uh, you know, take advantage because this is a important, very important time in your life and uh, take advantage and also enjoy because this is the, one of the most important messages. You, know? you have to enjoy what you do, uh, science or anything else, but uh, yes, do whatever you think uh, you will enjoy. This is really very important. So then I decided to continue and start science and this is a picture of me uh, well probably you didn't even know who I was in there because I look very different but nevertheless <laughs> uh, this was a, a bit later during my PhD and for my PhD I actually um, I was going to say chose but I didn't choose I didn't have a choice really there was a position open in a lab uh, that was working on um, uh, you know interactions between nucleic acids and proteins and that seemed not very attractive to me. I, have to, I can confess now. Now I can do it. I couldn't at the time, but now I can say it wasn't attractive at all. And uh, not only that, it was extremely difficult, very, very difficult. Um, because when I was working there already for four years, imagine, I mean, almost four years, I discovered, found out that there was an artifact actually embedded into the protocols that the whole lab was using, and including myself. And in fact, that artifact could um, uh, be affecting the vast majority of data that were published in the lab in the last decade or something, right? So that was a complete disaster, as you might imagine, and I was a PhD student, right? I mean, I wasn't... And, um, you know, uh, I had to prove that that was the case before even telling my, my supervisor, because, I mean, I just didn't know, but the thing is that we were very close to... Uh, write, uh, you know, a, a manuscript to be published because we thought we have found something extremely interesting. I'm not going to give you the details, right? But in my, I mean, I was always thinking, if this is that important and that interesting, how come is it that no one has seen it before? So maybe there's something wrong in here, and indeed there was something wrong. And I managed to find uh, the artifact, and that was extremely, extremely painful. I can tell you, I lost 15 kilos, I, you know, I, I got sick and everything, but I managed to do it. I don't recommend anybody to do that, right? It's not that I'm saying that this is what you have to do. But those were, you know, different times. And I also wanted to do it and to see what happened. And that is something that, of course, no one has to be exposed to that. And, and that doesn't happen. Uh, doesn't happen now. And it would not happen here, for sure. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the what I wanted to tell you is that the outcome of that is that when I presented my, my, Viva, my Viva, my PhD, um, I got three job offers the very same day to go to very nice places. So, you know, I mean, as I said, I don't, I don't want anybody to go through that. But even if for whatever reason, different circumstances, you are in a very difficult time, think that, you know, you will find, if you can find a way out, that will be even better. So, and you will be stronger. So this is like pandemic, as, and as you said, you know. Um, like here, you know, imagine, you know, like a couple of years ago, you could not be here with all your friends and, you know, listening to me in this case, but, you know, maybe um, better people in, in other circumstances. But, uh, you know, things um, sometimes help you a lot. So I tell my students, you know, we have to somehow develop a bit of resilience to be able to enjoy all the, you know, the, 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 the fantastic results that you can get. And as a matter of fact, I, I decided to actually then move 
to do something else. And since I was looking at um, interactions between molecules, I thought, well, I would like to actually go a bit you know, higher in the level of complexity. And then I decided to do my, my first postdoc, still in Madrid at another institute. And uh, I was working there on program cell death, which is really very interesting, apoptosis, right? And at that time, it was very early times for, for apoptosis. No, nobody knew what that was. And uh, I really liked it so much that I wanted to continue uh, working on it, but rather on cells in, in the dish, I wanted to actually go again a bit higher in the level of complexity and uh, decided um, uh, you know, to, to go first to, to Munich, to the Max Planck Institute, where we could have met. And, uh, but then, um, for different reasons, I moved to London for, for a long postdoc to actually try to help and you know, answer a, you know, some aspects of this very interesting question. So how is it that uh, one individual can actually develop from a single cell? And this is a question that fascinates us all, actually, and we work for that for years and years and years. And uh, the more we look at it, the more we learn, and more interesting it comes, you know, and uh, it's really, really, really fantastic. And uh, where is it that I did that? This was in London, and um, at the National Institute for Medical Research. This is 1899, it's, it's again me there <laughs> in the lab. And I think that this is when we actually met uh, Probably, probably in London uh, for the first time. This is a very interesting institute. I mean, it was a, you know, a very peculiar building, and, I, and you'll see why I'm saying that. But it was a very uh, fascinating time for developmental biology. You know, this, you know, the two last decades of the 20th century were actually amazing in terms of how much uh, developmental biology progressed. And uh, you know, I said that the building was interesting for many reasons. I mean, the labs were very, you know, very nice and the excellent atmosphere, excellent science. But actually, this building was used to film Batman. So, do you? Does this uh, sort of um, picture looks familiar to you? So, this is the National Institute for Medical Research. <laughs> no, no, it's not a joke. Eh? It's, it is true. It is true. Um, unfortunately, um, the building does not exist anymore. Um, sorry. Uh, yes, the building does not exist anymore just because um, you know this institute has been moved to central London and now is the Creek Institute that uh, I'm sure you heard about. It's an excellent institute, and this is when the building was being demolished. So all of us that actually had been working there were very sad to actually see these pictures, but we were circulating the pictures and we were trying to see, oh, this was my lab, or, you know, where were, you know, your things. But the building does not exist, but I have it in my office, because I have this little thing that I was giving at the 100th anniversary of the Institute in 2014, that it was, you know, the celebration of the 100 and also the close opening to the Creek Institute. So, you know, um, my time during my postdoc was actually um, very exciting. I enjoyed everything, you know, science, uh, friends, colleagues, London itself, many, many things. And uh, in terms of science, it was a fantastic time, you know, because it was the time when, um, you know, this fantastic organization, morphogenetic processes dividing our body into, you know, different sort of segments were actually described at the molecular level. Um, I'm showing just examples of papers that actually were, uh, you know, published uh, from, from there. Um, the National Institute for Medical Research. It was the time also, not only the segmentation of the, <clears throat> of the hindbrain, but the whole you know, segmentation code and the expression of the Hox genes that I'm sure you know, some of you may be familiar with. Uh, it was also the time in which uh, it was identified uh, you know, how misodem was induced, and it was also the time when the, the, the gene that determined sex was actually identified. So I was very fortunate and lucky to be you know, very close to all these um, fantastic and fundamental findings in developmental biology. So what is it that I did myself? So I was working on the segmentation of the nervous system, similar to, you know, to the first paper there, uh, but you know, just 
like a few months before I went back to Spain. We did another screening because we were looking for new genes at that time in vertebrates. You know, Drosophila was already there and there were many, many genes, but not so many, uh, you know, invertebrates. So we, uh, you know, did uh, several screenings and that meant, for instance, that, you know, we have to make ourselves libraries that actually took forever to, 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 to generate. But nevertheless, I was very lucky and uh, we could um, clone this gene that actually Johan referred to, um, snail or slug. Slug, uh, well, they are two different genes, but they are very similar and they uh, encode, they give rise to a protein that is extremely interesting because of the function. So what I'm showing you here is just uh, you know, one uh, picture that no one would know what it is now, which is an autoradiograph. This is the way we have to isolate genes in the past. Uh, <laughs> so probably you, some of you might remember going with the films here and there. But uh, this is the screening for, for the snail gene. And, um, and then, of course, what we wanted to do is to see where these genes were expressed in, in the embryos. And this is what we found. This is a, a chicken embryo. I mean, a section of a chicken embryo. And you can see this uh, tube, which is actually the neural tube developing. And then these cells in blue, meaning that they are expressing the gene on top of that. And uh, you know, this is a very um, interesting cell population, which is called, for obvious reasons, the neural crest. So it's a crest on top of the neural tube. And uh, why is this? Um, population so, so interesting and so important? Well, it is for many different reasons, but one um, is because these cells are motile, as uh, Jochen was mentioning. And uh, if we now look at the whole embryo that you know, this session was taken from, you um, not only see um, you know, this crest on top of the neural tube, you also see these streams of cells that seem to be migrating out. And at the time, uh, it, that was already known, the neural crest was a very important population, but uh, it wasn't that clear how is it that the cells were delaminating from the neural tube and how they were actually then going. So for us, it was uh, very interesting for the first time to look at the whole embryo and to see the streams of migratory cells as it had been predicted using different uh, technologies. But of course, uh, we could uh, now also see how the cells migrate in the, in the embryo uh, from this uh, you know, lagging of the neural tube uh, and the, you know, the future neural tube and then moving away, going to different places. And I hope that you can appreciate that if you look at the end of the movie, you will see a picture very similar to the one that you see on the right, which is the one that I actually showed you before. So you see these are cells that are migrating out. This is uh, you know, the chicken embryo. And uh, it, this is easy to do. You just uh, you know, um, inject a fluorescent substance in the lumen of the neural tube, and therefore all the cells are labeled. And uh, when the cells migrate, they are labeled, and then you can see them. And this is one of the beauties of developmental biology and the, the model systems that we can, that we can use. Um, so what is it? What is the neural crest? I said it was a very interesting population. It is because of these fantastic migratory properties, but also because it can give rise to many different cell types. So these uh, cells are therefore pluripotent, and you know, looks like a miracle. You know, these cells, you know, they are on top of the neural tube. They delaminate, migrate, and they can be converted in cells as different as neurons or pigment cells or actually our uh, you know, craniofacial bone, many different types of cells. And of course, the impact of that in, our, uh, you know, in, the, in the morphogenesis of our body and in the generation of tissues and forms uh, goes really beyond our imagination even at the beginning, because if the neural crests are the cells, that, I mean, all pigmented cells of our body, except for the pigment epithelium in the eye, are derived from the neural crest, it means that you know, the different uh, patterns that you see in, in, the, in the animal kingdom are, is actually due uh, to different pigmentation in different migratory cell populations. And if uh, the neural crest is also uh, the origin of the craniofacial skeleton, this goes beyond that because it, this is what it makes us you know, to be uh, very similar, but a bit different so that we can recognize each other. So face recognition is actually due to neural crest, and I find this really fascinating. Huh? So, uh, you know, when I was um, 
still doing my, my PhD in London, um, I was already thinking whether I you know, should go back to Spain or stay in, in England, or maybe accepting an offer that I had uh, you know, from New York. And um, you know, several things happened. Uh, one of them is that my, my father was very sick at that time, and I thought, oh, you know, maybe I can go back, and also maybe I can go back and try to do these very nice experiments that I'm doing here back home. And so I decided to do that, and I went back, um, moved back, uh, actually, to Madrid, uh, to the um, uh, Spanish Research Council, and I was very fortunate to get uh, you know, a permanent position at the, at the Spanish Research Council after a very difficult sort of national competition, but I was, you know, uh, very interesting to do. And, um, you know, again, the building looks, you know, sort of uh, like very classic and old and everything, but I don't know how many of you have seen this uh, series. I don't know, it's Netflix, I think it is. Um, House of Money, you told me it is. Uh, Money Heist. This is the building. So, the <laughs> It was filmed in there, so it seems like I'm looking for films rather than for, you know, <laughs> for research institutes, but it's very true. So if you have seen it, if not, it's very interesting. And uh, yeah, so it was, it was filmed there. Now it's creating a lot of security problems at the headquarters of the Spanish Research Council, because everybody wants to go there and have pictures taken and everything, and it's a big problem for security. So, but uh, anyway, um, this is what it is. Um, uh, of course, um, you know, just coincidence, this happened a few years ago, and I moved back to Spain 30 years ago. So we just um, celebrated the 30th anniversary of my lab, which I don't want to even say, but you heard it already, so it's terrible. <laughs> but it is true. 30 years ago, I moved back and I started my lab. And uh, when I, you know, when I moved back, the only thing that we had at, at the time that I found fascinating was what I showed you. You know, this embryo showing us all these cells migrating out. So the question was, well, you know, if this gene is actually expressed in these cells that are migrating, it might be, it might be doing something uh, for this, maybe for this migration. So what we did is that we uh, were looking at um, early chicken embryos, uh, cultured chicken embryos, and we decided to, to try and block the function of the gene and see what happens. So what I'm showing you here are terrible pictures. I mean, you can, I can tell you, so you can also say they are very old and it looks terrible to me now. But nevertheless, what you see also in the scheme is that when we blocked the function of this gene, the cells didn't um, you know, move from the neural tube. They got sort of trapped in there. And that was really very interesting because, uh, believe it or not, at that time it was the first time that uh, you know this thing sort of worked. I mean, you have the embryo and you put you know things on top and it worked, and um, these uh, regions. And also we saw this amazing phenotype, very very clear. So the cells could not move out of the neural tube, and um, not only the neural tube. It also happened in other territories in the embryo where cells also have to move. Like, you know, to form the mesoderm and the mesodermal derivatives, the cells also have to ingress in the embryo and migrate. This didn't happen either when we blocked this, uh, you know, the, the function of this gene. So that meant that indeed um, the function of, of, of the protein encoded by this gene was to help cells move make, you know, sort of, as you said, you know, static cells into cells that are actually moving. <laughs> well, you did better, but anyway. Um, this is essentially what, uh, you know, we found. And uh, uh, at that time, we were, I think, allowed more than now to speculate in our papers, right? In our scientific papers. And then in the last paragraph of that paper, we said that it looks as if maybe the reactivation of these genes in, in, in cancer could actually help for cancer cells to acquire this uh, migratory phenotype that would allow them to delaminate from the primary tumor and form metastasis. You know that the metastases are the secondary tumors that are formed in different organs, and the cells you know, are coming from the primary tumor, the first one, and of course you also know that uh, metastasis uh, is, is the cause of more than 90% of cancer-associated deaths. So learning how metastasis happen is actually still is a very important uh, uh, medical problem and a societal problem and a biological problem as well. So thinking about cell behavior, this delamination of cells in the embryo and the delaminations of cells from the primary tumor looked somehow similar. And we hypothesized without any experimental basis at the time that maybe 
the reactivation of these uh, embryonic genes in cancer could actually help the cancer cells to make metastasis. So we then decided to, well, start to, to work on that immediately, and it took us quite a while, but we could show that this was the case. And indeed, these developmental genes that should be completely silent in the, in, in the adult actually are reactivated in cancer cells uh, for them to delaminate from the primary tumor. And what I'm showing you here is just um, you know, some sections of uh, breast tumors, and you can see different things. So on the, on the left, column, uh, we have just the, the morphology of the cancer cells, and on the right, we have the expression of this developmental gene. So in, in the first one, uh, this corresponds to a very well differentiated uh, tumor, which in terms of prognosis means that, you know, maybe this, this tumor is not invasive, it's not producing metastasis. And then, uh, you know, our, our favorite uh, at the time developmental gene was not expressed. However, when the tumor looked really undifferentiated and for anatomopathologies, meaning that, you know, mm, uh, well, you know, they could be actually uh, um, has, uh, you know, malignant, malignancy associated, then we could see the reactivation of the gene. So um, in terms of molecular mechanism, what we found is that this gene encodes for a transcription factor. That means that it's going to be regulating the expression of many of the genes. And in fact, what happens is that it is actually um, in addition to provide these this motility properties, it was also repressing this static sort of epithelial phenotype that is, I mean, the, one of the most important features of these immotile cells is that they have uh, proteins in the surface that actually uh, can bind cells to each other. So adhesion between two cells is mainly done in epithelial cells, not, not only, of course, but mainly mediated by one protein that is called ecatherin. So what we found is that our, our protein was actually repressing the glue between cells, and therefore this explained why the cells could actually migrate. So, well, that was all very good and very nice, but let me tell you another story associated with that, which is that even though for developmental biologists that was very sort of intuitive and uh, sort of obvious, sorry to say, it was not the case for the cancer community. And uh, indeed, I mean, if you imagine, you know, the doctors have to deal with sections only. They cannot see cells moving, of course, uh, at all, and particularly at that time. So it was very difficult for them to understand how a developmental gene, a gene for an embryo, can actually be important for cancer. And uh, those were not that easy times uh, for, for a while because, you know, many people thought that that was our idea, but nothing, you know, probably not that important for cancer. And again, we, you know, we believed that that may be probably okay. And at the time, I was uh, still working in, uh, in Madrid. Now I'm, I'm in Alicante already for 18 years, but I was already in Madrid and uh, still in Madrid, and I was working at the Cajal Institute. I don't know whether you have heard of Cajal, Santiago Ramon y Cajal, probably not, it doesn't matter. But if you have, um, he was a very, um, important uh, Spanish neuro neurobiologist is sometimes, you know, mentioned to be one of the fathers of the modern neurobiology. And uh, he, of course, you know, it was Cajal, I was at the Cajal Institute, and all his books and papers and slides and everything were there. So I was looking at them, you know, from time to time because he, he could um, draw really very nicely. He was like an artist, right? So he was drawing everything that he saw. And even though he's considered and is famous for, new, for being a neuroscientist, he was professor of anatomopathology. And at that time, um, they always produced their own you know, manual of anatomopathology. And Cajal also did that. And uh, what I'm going to be showing you are uh, Cajal's drawings uh, that were published in uh, 1890. Oh, sorry, I have this in Spanish, but I can translate it to you. So, so these are, you know, the very same um, pictures that I showed you before in the, in the benign tumor and in the, in the malignant tumor. And these are the, the drawings that Cajal actually did and published in 1890. So I hope that you can appreciate much better in his drawings than in my pictures uh, that the, the, the cells on the left are sort of polygonal and they are very close to each other, adjacent to each other. And uh, on the right, 
I hope that you can see that the cells are more sort of rounded. There are spaces in between the cells. And, uh, and also there is one cell that I actually highlighted in red that looks very weird, right? So then I thought, oh my goodness, you know, Cajal looking at tumors, you know, in the chapter of the tumors in this manual, he was already thinking of cell migration from the tumors, the lamination, and this process that we have been looking at. And uh, I remember that, you know, some people were telling me, I mean, you're crazy. I mean, how come, you know, Cajal in 1890, I'm going to be thinking about this thing that you still have not proven. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's not that I was just thinking of it, it's that he actually wrote it. So if you see the red cell has a B, you see the B? So the B is this you know, sort of label that Cajal put, and this is what he said. He said, around the epithelial islands, epithelial cells, islands, there is no basement membrane. Basement membrane is this thing that you can actually see. Ah, maybe I can show you with this. Can you see my mouse? Yes. So you see this in here, this is the basement membrane separating, in this case, the tumor from the stromal cells, from the, from the other cells. And in here, you cannot see that structure, right? So he was saying, in these cells, there is no basement membrane. And we have to mention, because they are very uh, common, different forms in the cells that have you know, star-like, pear-like, many different uh, shapes, like the one that actually he had here. And then he went on and said, this really um, shows that the cells are separated from each other and that can explain the invasive tendency of these cells. That without glue, <laughs> that's what he says, glue, now we would say ecatherin, the molecule that I tell you that actually maintains cells together, without glue can easily immigrate from the tumor. So, I mean, Remember, I told you, I mean, I put you in context, right? So this is when I was not fighting, but, you know, trying to, to say, you know, this is going to be important for cancer. And then, you know, it was uh, more than 100 years before that Cajal already proposed that just by looking at, you know, some tumor sections. So to me, it was, um, you know, I don't know how to explain that, but uh, it was really reassuring. So that I say, oh, yeah, let's continue and let's prove it. And as a matter of fact, I would not go on with this, but I can tell you that now, looking at this process, uh, this embryonic process, when it is reactivated in, the, in, in cancer, is one of the, um, well, I would say, one of the very active fields in, in cancer research. Uh, so what is it that we are talking about? We're talking about what is called the epithelial to mesenchymal transition that Jochen uh, alluded to. Uh, and that is, you know, the conversion of an epithelial static cell into another cell that can actually move away, that can actually behave like an isolated cell migrating uh, on its own, and that is actually used for many different processes in the embryo. So the movies are working, and what I wanted to show you with that is that on the left you see one static epithelial cell line that we put in culture, and then these very same cells when we make them to express this developmental gene, they completely change behavior, as you can see. And you can see that they become migratory and not only motile, also invasive, meaning that they can actually digest what they find their way and then they can, they can find their way to their destination. And I always say that, you know, I've seen these movies for, I don't know, thousands of times, um, but I am still fascinated by it because See what one single protein can do, what one, the activation of one single gene can do to the behavior of a cell. But of course, uh, this process is not important because, you know, <laughs> because it's beautiful, but it is important because it lies at the heart of many different processes. So to start uh, with morphogenesis, the vast majority of our tissues in origin are actually the result of one of these transitions from static to, to motile cells. It is also important in homeostasis, so it, that is very easy to understand. When you have a wound, the wound has to heal, and for the, heal to, for the wound to heal, you really need the, the two edges to actually get closer, and you need a bit of a cell movement there as well. But indeed, as I mentioned, there is another, another aspect to that, which is that these genes are reactivated in different pathologies. 
So the most obvious one is when cancer cells delaminate from the primary tumor and disseminate throughout the body. But there are other diseases such as fibrosis, which is a degenerative disease that I will not mention today, and some other really very important aspects in the biology of the cell. So to summarize this part, um, it is important now to consider that this process was implemented and, and fixed in evolution during the evolution for cells that um, were born very far from the final destination. Therefore, they have to start migrating to, to reach the place where they have to do their function. And also another important concept is that it is usually is transient and it is reversible. What does this mean? This means that when the cells arrive to their destination, they have to switch off this motility program because now they have to do their job. So they have to stop, they have to colonize, and then they have to produce uh, different tissues. And this is, you know, very beneficial in the embryo. If these genes don't work or are defective, mutant, whatever, the cells cannot migrate and the cells are not available to make tissues and the embryo cannot progress. However, you know, this is very good for the embryo, but it's terrible, in fact, for cancer because, um, you know, promotes metastasis. So it looked sort of pretty obvious to, not to, to us, but, you know, to many people that if we could actually prevent this process in cancer, we could maybe, you know, prevent metastasis formation, which is like a dream, right? So we and all and the companies and many labs started to see whether we could find inhibitors for this motility process. And um, why? Well, because, you know, it is actually very similar to what happens in the embryo to what happens in, in cancer. So essentially, blue means static, epithelial, yellow means motile. Here I'm showing you another example. It's not the neural crest. This is the, as I said, also the formation of different tissues, the, the mesoderm in this case. And uh, so the cells, they laminate here in the embryo and they migrate, you know, to different places. If you then look at the embryo later, when the cells have already reached their destination in this axis, the, lateral, the, the medial lateral axis, you see that they are all blue again. So the, the program is switched off, is silenced. And, um, you know, the same happens in cancers. Here is the primary tumor. Some cells can delaminate. Some of them can intravasate, get into the, into the vessels, and therefore they, you know, um, disseminate throughout the body. And then some of them can still survive, um, extravasate out of the vessels and then make the, the secondary tumor, the metastasis, which is very similar to the primary tumor. Again, epithelial. So this means the process is going on here, the cells are motile, but then in order to form this big secondary tumor, they have to go back to you know, being static and being um, epithelial in this case. So, you know, again, we thought, well, I mean, if we can prevent the delamination process, magnificent. I mean, that would be a miracle, right? Fantastic. And so we started to, to, to look for that. But then we realized, again, looking at the embryos, that that was probably not a very good idea. Why? For several reasons that we didn't really very know, know, know very well at the beginning. And was that, uh, you know, um, it is still true, the concept is, is still true, if you can prevent the exit of cells from the primary tumor, you will prevent metastasis. But the fact is that um, patients, at the time of diagnosis, they already have many cells circulating in the blood. So we would be late, right? So if we are late, and there are cells that are already traveling, just to say informally and very sort of simply, uh, and if we prevent this, the movement, the cells would stop and you will be giving them the possibility to make tumors. So rather than preventing metastasis, we could even be promoting metastasis. I don't know whether I'm being you know, myself clear, but we, of course, don't want to do that. So um, this is the conclusion that we actually reached. So the, the reactivation of developmental programs in cancer is important for the dissemination of cells to, to, to make metastasis, but uh, this is not sufficient. The cells then have to get back to the immotile phenotype. And this means that really, um, you know, this is a fantastic plasticity associated with this process in the embryo and in cancer, and we don't want to inhibit the movement. So what can we do? Um, that was not a good idea. Uh, but the embryo 
showed us why. And this is why I wanted to tell you, we always need animal models to actually test these very complicated organismal responses, you know, because we can now do many things in vitro. We can do many things with cells, many things. And we can generate, you know, tissues, even interactions with, it, with cells. But the systemic response and the whole response for cancer or for the immune system, it is still, you know, impossible to do in, in vitro. And we still need animal models. And I think this is really very important for you to, to, to know. And uh, we can discuss that later if you wish. But nevertheless, the embryos taught us that we have to do something else. And now uh, we are all moving to do something else. So in the last decades, we have concentrated our efforts in cancer, looking at the primary tumor. Huh? Now we actually have to look at the metastatic side, what is called the metastatic niche. Because now what we want to do is prevent this colonization and the, the formation of the metastasis. Because we know that we're going to be late in terms of the, the lamination. So what can we do to try and prevent this colonization? We have to understand what are the signals that the cells see when they reach their destination to tell them to stop. And this is what we would like to actually prevent from happening. So we are still, uh, of course, I mean, working on that, and it is the contribution of many different labs around the world that are helping to understand a bit better the biology of, of the cancer cell, uh, taking advantage of the knowledge from uh, embryos. So developmental biology is not only to learn how embryos develop, how our body is formed, it's also to learn a lot about uh, potential adult diseases. And we always go back to the embryo. And I'm going to show you in a couple of slides another process that we are very much interested in and that we are looking at, which is looking at symmetries. Um, so, of course, I mean, it's immediately obvious that here you have two different symmetries, the radial symmetry in the, in the star. At this stage of uh, you know, the, 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 the um, adult star and also the bilateral beautiful symmetry in this uh, butterfly. And of course, it's immediately evident for us that we are also bilaterally symmetric. I mean, when we look at ourselves, you know, we have this axis here, just like that. And we are, you know, not perfect, not perfectly symmetric, as you can do if you look at your, you know, the two sides of your face, but almost uh, bilaterally symmetric. However, inside, we are not symmetric. We have many asymmetries. And one of the asymmetries that you know of is actually the position of the heart. So the heart, we always say, is on the, on the left, right? I mean, you, you know, of course. Um, it's not really completely on the left. It's that the, the, the posterior part of the heart is actually displaced to the left. And then, you know, we were actually interested in that because in addition to several other mechanisms, there is one that also has to do with cell movements. So how is it that the heart is actually located in the final position? So all the organs, all, uh, appear in the midline, in the center of the body. And then they have to occupy different uh, positions. And this is important because then you can uh, you know, be more efficient in, in, in space occupancy inside. And also because the coordination between the different systems has to work perfectly right. OK, so imagine the heart at the beginning is, is a tube, right? It's just like a tube, like that. And then it depends, uh, I mean, on the species, but uh, there are general principles here as well. Cells are incorporated in the anterior part of the tube and in the posterior part of the tube. And what happens is that the cells that are incorporated in the posterior part of the tube, there are many more cells coming from the, from the right than those from the left. And then they are, you know, exert a press, pressure and then they, boom, they push the posterior part of the heart. And this is how the heart is actually positioned in the final, in the, in the final um, uh, position. So this is very simple, and this is what it is. So again, you know, this um, movement and these uh, you know, orchestrated processes of cell movements help in the position of the different organs, as simple as that. And let me just show you examples of uh, the heart of the zebrafish. Um, here you have um, on, the, on the left, the normal position of the heart, and you see the arrow indicating the, you know, the, the movement. And then when these genes don't work, what happens is that the, cell, the, the heart stays in the middle. It's called mesocardia, so the, the heart in the middle, <laughs> meso, mid, middle, cardia, the heart. And, uh, and there you go. It's not that the heart is on the right. 
the, the problem, when this, this uh, process does not occur, the heart stays on, on, in, the, in, the mid, in the midline, in the center. This is the fish, and this is the chicken. It's very similar. You know? And uh, you know, if you uh, decide to actually come for the summer course, you will be seeing beautiful cells in action. You will be seeing beautiful movies. And I wanted to show you a couple of them that uh, you know, we, we do. This, these are neural crest cells migrating. Um, uh, in, in a living embryo, so I hope you like it. And uh, this is the whole fish in a light sheet microscope showing how this, these cells that I was talking about are actually moving anterior then to be incorporated into the heart. Um, so I, I, well, you know, to me this is really very nice. I don't know whether you like it or not, but I can tell you that you have beautiful, um, you know, possibilities to actually come here and see uh, better, better movies, actually. So just to, to, to finish with the, 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 this uh, you know, scientific part, just wanted to leave you with this picture, which is just uh, you know, the, the primary tumor, the metastasis, and, uh, and the embryo. The embryo is overlooking because, I mean, if I can summarize everything in one sentence, that would be it. You know? Reactivation of uh, embryonic genes in the adult, um, of course, in different pathologies, including cancer and organ degeneration, and um, fibrosis. and uh, in fact, these genes now have become very interesting uh, therapeutic targets because I mentioned at the beginning they are not usually expressed in normal situation, in the healthy situation in the adult, but reactivated only in, in these pathologies. I mean, not 100%, but essentially this is, um, I mean, overall we can say that. And therefore now these embryonic genes are converted in unexpected but safe uh, therapeutic targets for several diseases, including uh, cancer and, and fibrosis. So I just uh, wanted to show you my lab. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I'm here having a really good time with my friends and with you, and they're working <laughs> in the lab now. So, you know, I'm very privileged. And of course, I also have to thank all the uh, funding agencies that are helping us to do all, all this. And uh, remember, I, sh I showed you a picture of me at the university that was in 80, I don't remember, 81 or something like that. So we actually met with a very same friend um, not that long ago, just before pandemic. So here we are, the two of us. You know? So um, she is not a scientist, and this is why we have not met for such a long time. If, if she were a scientist, we would have met you know, many times. But we decided to meet again. It's true. So what happens? What happens? You, you don't want to look at this, huh? <laughs> But, um, you know, but anyway, so we met in, in 2019, just before pandemic, and, uh, you know, it's very important that, uh, you know, keeping friends is always, you know, takes you, you know, back and you have your feet on earth. It's very important. Same for, for mentors. These are my two mentors um, for my postdoc studies uh, in Madrid and also in, in London. And we, of course, continue to be friends. And uh, so this is uh, Abelardo in the middle, my, my supervisor for my first postdoc in Madrid, and David Wilkinson, who retired. This is uh, his uh, retirement party, Jochen, that happened uh, just before pandemic, and it's actually all very nice. But the other thing that I wanted to tell you is that uh, even though many people might think that science is very tough, um, I, don't know whether I, can, I don't know whether I can do this. Can I ask how many of them would like to be scientists? Yes? <laughs> How many of you uh, have been, well, considering that you would like to be scientist? Don't be afraid, it doesn't matter, it's no problem. It's no problem either way, right? <laughs> well, very many, actually. I would say, um, I would say 50%, which is amazing. <laughs> um, uh, well, I mean, don't worry. I mean, those who have not thought about it, I think, you know, this is really very important because what I wanted to tell you is that, well, two things. First of all, being a scientist is not boring, and being bored is one of the worst things that can happen to you no matter. You don't want to be bored at all. So it's not boring, it's, it's fun. And also, not only that, it is um, important for many reasons. You already saw that, you know, we have been, you know, friends for a long, long time. This is precious. But that also, I mean, being a scientist is one of the jobs in which, even if you are not rich, because of course that's another matter, um, no. <laughs> but without, you know, being rich, that is not necessary, uh, you can travel a lot. 
And uh, you know, these are pictures that I have taken or I have been taken in different places in all continents, you know, seeing uh, friends and having amazing experiences just because I am a scientist, you know. And, um, and if you notice also, uh, I have chosen the pictures in which there are women, right? And these are women in science. And I think this is also a very important message. You know, uh, there are a lot of studies saying that, uh, you know, not, still, you know, women are not really going into science. Uh, some studies even say that, uh, you know, girls already at the age of six, they think that they are not going to make it in science. Rubbish. Don't believe that. I mean, it's not true. You can actually do it. And I think it is very important for us to all realize that we, we, can, we can do it. I mean, I'm not saying that it is easy, but which job is actually easy if you want to do well, you know, everything is very difficult. And in particular, you know, these pictures I'm showing you scientists, it's not only me. All these women there, in the, in the most striking picture that I have in here, uh, they are all scientists coming from uh, uh, six different countries, and they are actually working in seraphish, uh, the six of them, that was in Doha. And, um, you know, some of them, even, you know, this one here that you see uh, in the middle, uh, Mansoura, she's actually been working in my lab. So we have a program for African women, and she's from uh, Nigeria, and she has been working in my lab for a year. She actually had to leave early because the pandemic came and she was there with her baby, and that uh, they have to be going back, you know, because the pandemic have to go back to, to, to Africa, but we keep in touch. So this is, you know, really very important. And... If you allow me, I will show you some pictures that are a bit embarrassing to me, but this can even happen. You know, I mean, here I am with the king of Spain, so giving me a prize, which is amazing. <laughs> and um, he is very nice, actually. He's very talkative and everything like me. Um, no, I'm not nice, I'm talkative. Um, but, um, but, you know, that was very amazing. I mean, this is the royal palace. Who could have told me when I was a kid or even, you know, much later that I could do that or being at the Royal Academy or being friend with Catalin Carico? Uh, I'm sure you know who she is. She lives not that far from here. Um, Catalin is the person who, after being working on um, RNA for decades, she was one of the, well, one of the um, uh, persons that actually allowed us to survive, really, because she developed uh, the vaccine for uh, against COVID, right? And uh, you know, this, you know, she lives very close to here. It's 100 kilometers or something, Mannheim, or I don't know what it is, but, <laughs> but but it's close to here. And we were, you know, we are friends now. We met in Paris when we we got a, a prize in, in Paris as well. And she's a very nice person. I don't know whether she's been here, has she? No? Oops, well, that's a matter. Okay, so, so, so it's, it's, she's really nice, actually, and uh, it's very good, you know, talking to her because she was working on fundamental research for 20 years, and just because of that, the vaccine could be developed in less than a year. And uh, there are data that indicate that in the very first year of, of vaccine administration, that saved more than 25 million lives. Right? So this is really very important, and this happened you know, close to here as well. So what is it that it is important? You have to keep your eyes wide open. Yeah? You know what this is? It's not an eye, right? No, it's not an eye. It's a planaria. It's a mutant planaria. And you know, the funny thing is that it's not my lab, right? This comes from my friend's lab in Barcelona, Emilie Salo, maybe you know him. And uh, when I saw that, I was amazed. And I said, oh, what an Egyptian eye, no? It looks like an Egyptian eye. And I told, and I told Emily, can you please lend me your Egyptian eye picture? And you know what? He didn't know who, which one it was. <laughs> so why? Because we sometimes, you know, we concentrate on things. And I think this is a very good example to tell you. Keep your eyes open and wide open, you know, and everything that you see, you know, try to interpret because this is the fun of science. And with that, um, I will leave you and thank you very much. <laughs>